Hi there. Welcome, everybody. My name's Helen Sen. I'm Head of Conservation and Science at the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, and I'm your chair for this Royal Society of Edinburgh Investigates Conservation Series. Um, this session is being run in collaboration with the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. And the RSE Investigates Conservation Series ex is exploring the vast and varied work that's being done in the area of conservation, from the conservation of wildlife and the environment to the conservation of natural heritage. And throughout this series, we'll be asking important and at times tricky questions about the ethics in conservation and why conservation matters and how we engage the broader public in conservation efforts and the role of conservation in addressing the climate crisis and the increasing biodiversity crisis in Scotland and globally. And the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland is a specialist in species conservation, working on the conservation of species as diverse as the Dharma gazelle and the small scabious mining bee. And we have a commitment to helping with the recovery of 50 species over the coming decade. And some of you may have already heard from our colleague, Dr. Helen Taylor, who talked a few weeks ago about the effort to save invertebrate species that are on the brink of extinction through conservation breeding and release here in Scotland. But with this event, we're going to be zooming over to Cambodia to discover how the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland has been helping with the recovery of the critically endangered Siamese crocodile and the monitoring of Asian elephants with the use of genetic technology. And the launch of the new Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework um, earlier in the year, the importance of conservation of genetic diversity has finally been recognised within global biodiversity targets. And this work that we're going to talk about today illustrates why it's so important to conserve not just species and their ecosystems, but the genetic variation which underpins them and allows them to continually adapt and evolve to pressures like climate change and disease. So just to provide a bit of an overview about this event, this is an hour long event um, with a talk which will last for about 40 minutes and then a question and answer session. Please submit your questions throughout the event the Q&A function, um, which you'll be able to find um, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this event is being recorded and will be available to view on the RSE's YouTube channel shortly. And if you require subtitles, these can be turned on using the custom live streaming service, which is at the top left of the screen. And if you've got any problems with that, I'm sure you can pop a message in the chat and someone will be able to help you. OK, so it just leaves me now to introduce you to our speaker today, Dr. Alex Ball, who is my programme here at the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland and who's the programme manager for the RZSS Wild Genes Conservation Genetics Lab. Alex's job involves overseeing conservation work, conservation genetic work to support the recovery of 15 different species in Scotland and around the world. And the lab is currently working on Cap Cayley and Scimitar Hondorix, Pine Hoverfly and Himalayan Walls, and has a team of six staff working in the lab on analysis and in the biobank. Using genetic analysis to help with the recovery of threatened species is a fairly niche skill, and training is a big part of the work that we do. And to this end, we've been involved in a close partnership with the Royal University of Phnom Penh and Fauna and Flora International to establish the first conservation genetics lab in Cambodia. And this project, this is a project that Alex leads, and without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to him to talk about crocodiles, elephants and genetics in Cambodia. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, so I'm just going to share my slide. Uh, OK, so hopefully you can all see that. Uh, and thank you uh, to the RSE as well for inviting me to give this talk and for everyone attending. Uh, so as Helen outlined, I'm going to be focusing on our work in Cambodia, and I'm particularly going to focus on two projects, uh, the Siamese crocodile and the Asian elephant. Uh, but to start, I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview to the RZSS Wild Genes Lab and the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, just for, for people who might not be uh, fully familiar with us. So the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland is a wildlife conservation charity that was established over 100 years ago. And so its main mission is to uh, conserve uh, species within the wild, but it also owns two zoos, Edinburgh Zoo and the Highland Wildlife Park in the Cairngorms National Park in the north. So these are both based in Scotland and 
the conservation programmes are run out of both of these zoos, but they're focused on projects uh, within Scotland on native species, but also on the conservation internationally of over 23 different species uh, across the globe. Uh, and one of the really unique things about the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland is the RZSS Wild Genes Lab. Uh, and this is because we are one of only, uh, or the only zoo-based conservation genetics lab uh, in the UK. So I've just got a map here just showing you the locations of the various conservation projects that we work on. So there are the two zoos, uh, and these are our native species conservation projects. And it's just going to zoom out and show you the breadth of diversity of the projects and whereabouts in the world they're focused. So we don't use conservation genetics uh, on all of these projects, but we do on a large proportion of them. But other ones are focused on, on, on using other tools uh, to aid conservation priorities as well. And one of the really great things about the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland is that we can draw on multiple different expertise uh, because we have those zoos and we're also working on conservation projects in the wild. So we have expert animal keepers and veterinary teams that have a huge range of knowledge on a really diverse uh, array of species, often lots of threatened species as well that we hold within captive collections. And that can be really important for uh, conserving these species in the wild. We also have the field project team that sits within the conservation department that's focused on restoring uh, species in the wild. And we have the conservation genetics team, or the RZSS Wild Genes team, uh, and we produce genetic data that helps inform these conservation projects. Uh, and as Helen alluded to in her introduction, uh, biodiversity conservation uh, is, is really focused on three main pillars, and these are, are basically enshrined now uh, within the international community uh, by the Convention on Biological Diversity. And two of them uh, are much more familiar uh, concepts. Uh, to people and to conservation practitioners. And that is ecosystems and species. So obviously we want to preserve the diverse array of ecosystems that exist on our planet. And there can be large differences between them, between wetlands, deserts, uh, uh, woodland habitats. Uh, and it's important to preserve aspects of all of those. Uh, the most commonly uh, thought of concept within uh, biodiversity conservation is the species level uh, protection. Uh, and that's basically uh, using species, uh, uh, the more species you have within an area, uh, the higher biodiversity you have. And so it's important to protect all of the species in those areas to maintain uh, biological diversity. However, one of the most important aspects that's often overlooked is genetic diversity. And this is diversity that can be with, found within those species. And it's really important to protect that if we're going to uh, preserve species in the long term. Uh, and it basically it underpins both of these other pillars of biodiversity, because if you don't have uh, uh, high levels of genetic diversity, you can, uh, have, you can basically be left with species that are less able to adapt and survive into the future. And that reduces your species level of biodiversity that fundamentally then uh, leads to the degradation of ecosystems. So we're going to focus on that third component, uh, genetic diversity. And we have been focusing on that for over 10 years uh, within the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. So we realised it was a really important aspect of biodiversity conservation and have been uh, working, uh, working on it uh, on site at Edinburgh Zoo uh, since 2010. And it's now being recognised globally and internationally as a key concept, uh, as Helen outlined under the Kongmin. In treaty, and there's now targets to restore and protect genetic diversity uh, by 2030 that uh, all country or a lot of countries have signed up to. So, in the lab at Edinburgh Zoo, uh, on the right hand side of the slide, you can see a picture of what most visitors to the zoo would see. Uh, unfortunately, because of the sterile conditions that were required and, and uh, to reduce contamination, the public don't have access to the lab. But if you were to go inside, you'd see a typical lab setup as depicted on, on the bottom of, of this slide. Uh, lots of uh, white lab benches, white lab coats, uh, and machinery to extract and work with, uh, with DNA. Uh, as I mentioned, we're the only zoo-based conservation genetics lab in the UK, so we're in a really unique position. And we're one of only a handful in Europe. And we conduct internationally recognized scientific work. So I'm just putting up a few of our, our recent uh, scientific projects and papers that we publish in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, 
However, we don't see that as the most important aspect of our work. We see ourselves as a bridge between the academic uh, community and, and uh, the research that's going on in universities and the applied conservation sector. So actually uh, impacting conservation programs and, and future management on the ground. And obviously we, we're, we're in that position because of the huge range of new technology and new research that is, is, is being conducted on genetics within the university sector. And our role is basically to pick and choose and work out and develop new techniques from some of that to uh, work out the best uh, way of tackling uh, the questions that are relevant to conservation and using genetics to do that. So as well as producing our scientific papers, we also feed in our results to uh, action plans, conservation action plans for a range of threatened species. And you can see a few examples of the ones we've been involved in on the right of this slide. So I'm just going to very briefly introduce you to the team. So we're a fairly small team uh, within uh, the Royal Zoological Society. We have two uh, research te um, two uh, technicians in the lab that produce the genetic data on our various projects, uh, Liz Heap and Magda Batowska. We have uh, two research scientists that then use that genetic data to uh, uh, analyze it, produce results and feed into action plans and, and management reports. We also have Dr. Cecilia Langhorn, who is our biobank coordinator, so preserving genetic material from a huge range of species, so it can be used to answer questions of conservation both now but also in the future. Uh, we have a new research assistant, Joe Howard McCoom, who actually joins us this week, and various uh, student interns and PhD students, and you can see a couple of them. And ultimately, as a team, uh, together, we are using tiny tools to answer really uh, big conservation relevant questions. And the reason we're using tiny tools is because we, we study DNA. So the fundamental building block of, of uh, biological organisms that uh, is basically uh, the genetic code or, or manual that creates uh, the proteins that then build up an organism. Uh, and each uh, genome or, or genetic material and each uh, individual biological organism uh, is unique and is different. So your DNA will be completely different from, from uh, the person next to you. Uh, and ultimately, as geneticists, what we're trying to do is convert those uh, DNA uh, double uh, helix structures, these molecules, really long molecules, into four letter codes that we can read and then look for differences in those codes between individuals and between So just to give you an idea on how uh, tiny DNA, uh, DNA is, if you were to take a single hair uh, from your head, uh, you'd be able to fit uh, a thousand strands of DNA across the width of that hair. So it's really, really small. And basically in the lab, we just work with colors and colorless liquids. Uh, we can't see the DNA until we've sequenced it. Uh, but although it's, it's, we can't see it with the naked eye, if you were to take those strands of DNA from a single cell in your body and line them end to end and stretch them out, they'd stretch for about two meters in length. And that's just from one of your cells. And you have a copy of your DNA or your genome in almost every single one of your cells in your body. So you've got a huge amount of DNA in your body. And that two meter long string of DNA in each one of your cells is about three billion letters long. So there's a huge amount of information in there that we can look at and look for variation and differences uh, between different organisms and different individuals. So just a very uh, quick uh, schematic of that. We obviously collect uh, genetic material in blood or tissue uh, or other forms of, of genetic material. We extract that DNA in the lab. We then sequence that DNA into uh, the four letter codes uh, that, that create that sequence. Uh, so, for example, we've got a single individual that we've extracted and sequenced here, and then we do that for another sample as well. And you can see that there's a difference between these two uh, different individuals, uh, the G and the C there, and that's what we're looking for when we and when we're talking about genetic diversity. Because there's a difference there, there's a variation. That's some diversity between these two uh, individuals, and obviously you can get different levels of diversity. So there's only one uh, uh, variation between these two samples. However, if we sequence another sample at this identical region, uh, you can find more diversity. And this is potentially maybe two different species in this sample uh, rather than uh, the same species. So that's 
fundamentally what we're doing as geneticists in that, finding that variation. And the reason we're looking for that variation and, and the reason it's so important for conserving, uh, uh, for conservation, is that there's a huge amount of variation within a single species. So on the slide here, we have one species, a uh, species of antelope, and the colours are basically depicting different genetic diversity that's found within a population or within this species. And if we get a decline within the species and we start losing individuals, you can see that we are also losing that diversity. We're losing those colours. So although we haven't lost the species at this point, we've still got, or in this case, three individuals left, uh, we have, uh, and so under the biodiversity uh, categorization of species, you say this species isn't extinct, we haven't lost this diversity. However, there's been lots of mini extinctions of genetic diversity that have occurred that we won't be able to get that diversity back. So even if this population expands and, and grows again, it's just going to be made up of that blue and that white diversity and not uh, the, the rest of the stuff we're lost, that have, that's already been lost. And this can be really important because genetic diversity fundamentally uh, can allow species to adapt to future changes uh, that happen in the environment, potentially due to new diseases or climate change affecting uh, the environment. So it's really vital that we understand what we've lost and, and uh, that we conserve uh, genetic diversity. And another great thing about working with uh, genetics from a conservation point of view is that all biological organisms have DNA. And so we can use very similar tools to look at a huge diversity and range of species. And we work on mammals, birds, reptiles, and even invertebrates. Uh, so you would have worked, heard about some of the invertebrates in the previous talk. And we're doing genetic work to help and aid their conservation as well. But today, I'm going to focus on just two of our projects. Uh, these are an example of a range of different projects that we're working on at the moment or recently finished working on uh, that we've been using genetics in the conservation of all of them. So if you do see anything of interest, feel free to answer ask a question about at the end. Uh, but today we're going to be focusing on Cambodia and I'm going to start by looking at uh, the Siamese crocodile project. So this is a picture of the Cambodian cardamom mountain landscape. Uh, so the Siamese crocodile and the Asian elephant that I'm going to be uh, focusing on today uh, are found within the Cardamom Mountains. So it's an area where they're, where they're both species are found. And Cambodia is a real jewel of biodiversity uh, within Southeast Asia. So it's a biodiversity, international recognised biodiversity hotspot. Uh, and it does have really large remaining tracts of, of forest and uh, wetland ecosystems. So it's the largest remaining tract of forest within Southeast Asia. It has the largest uh, freshwater lake in Southeast Asia. It has one of the biggest rivers in Asia, Asia running through it, the Mekong River. And so it has a huge uh, amount of, of landscape where elephants and crocodiles can still be, uh, or could still uh, be found. However, what Cambodia uh, uh, has within its biodiversity and the species that it's still hanging on to, it lacks in terms of infrastructure and uh, tools to help conserve these species. Uh, and as uh, before we started working with them, they didn't have any uh, conservation genetics uh, facilities uh, within the country. And what we have uh, uh, focused on since 2016 is trying to build that capacity over in the Royal University of Phnom Penh. So that's in the capital city of Cambodia, uh, within one of the universities, uh, and creating and developing the first conservation genetics laboratory uh, in the region. And this means that not only can we help uh, uh, help inform conservation of these two flagship species at the moment, but we're providing the tools and the training to staff in the university so they can then apply this to other species in the region as well. And, uh, uh, information from, uh, for, from a conservation perspective. And we've been closely working with Fauna and Flora International on this, Fauna and Flora uh, as of this year. Uh, and they have been part of a, a much uh, longer term capacity building project with the Royal University of Phnom Penh. And they've set up the first uh, conservation master's program within the country. And so we're really linking up with that and tying in our training with uh, that, pro that uh, project as well that's been going since uh, the early 2000s. So this is just an example of some of the, the training that we've conducted. We've mostly been focusing on training the technicians uh, and developing the laboratory. 
but we've also been involved in training uh, master students on, on the master's program uh, and the first training uh, uh, exercise took place in 2016 you can see the team that was involved in that on the top left uh, of this figure and we've been taking over new uh, genetic techniques and tools that we develop in edinburgh over to the lab so they can then use them uh, for conservation going forward and we've been doing that since, since 2000 Uh, and we've been using the Siamese crocodile and the Asian elephant in as training tools uh, for that capacity building, but at the same time producing data that is relevant and being fed into conservation programs on the ground in real time. Uh, and the reason we've been focusing on the Siamese crocodile is because it's a critically endangered species within the country, and it was thought to be uh, extinct in the wild. It was a real, a real uh, concern in the 1990s. Uh, until in the year 2000, Fauna and Flora International discovered a remnant wild population in the Cardamom Mountain. There's a map of Cambodia on the right hand side, and the red star is the Cardamom Mountains. Uh, for that region, there was uh, one remaining population found that was thought to be uh, a re less than 100 uh, Siamese crocodiles uh, remaining in the wild in the world. So since then, uh, a few other remnant wild populations have been found. Uh, it's not very many and it's very few numbers. Uh, and this is a species that used to be found across the whole of Southeast Asia uh, within, within the freshwater landscape. So huge, massive, drastic declines. However, there are tens of thousands of crocodiles in feather farms uh, throughout Southeast Asia, so not just in Cambodia. And this is one of the reasons for the declines. They have been poached from the wild and taken into these farms for the leather industry. And there's over 500 crocodile farms, or it's about 500 legally registered crocodile farms in Cambodia at, uh, at the moment. Uh, most of these are around the Tonle Sap area. So this is the largest lake uh, in Southeast Asia. You can see it on the map here. Uh, and most of the farms are congregated around there. And so what Fauna and Flora uh, International wanted to do was use these crocodiles from the farms in a breeding and release program. So set the breeding release program using these crocodiles and then reintroduce them into uh, the wetland landscapes that they've, they've gone from across the country. However, one of the problems within the leather farms is that uh, crocodile species are purposely hybridized together. So there's two native species to Cambodia, the Siamese crocodile and also the saltwater crocodile. They occur in uh, very different habitats. So as, as the name suggests, the saltwater crocodile is found in the coastal regions uh, and estuarine habitat, and the Siamese crocodile is found in inland in fresh water. Uh, they're both found in the farms and they're both hybridized purposefully together. Uh, and they're actually really difficult to tell apart uh, uh, visually, uh, especially when they're young. So the saltwater is one of the largest and most aggressive crocodile species in the world. The Siamese is one of the smallest and uh, most docile. Uh, but when they're young and juveniles, uh, they look very, very similar. And the hybrids are even more difficult to tell apart from, from each other and from the parental species. So that's where the, the genetic lab came in and where we can use genetic data to try and help uh, uh, FFI identify the Siamese crocodiles within these farms so they can uh, create their, their breeding and release program. And we developed two tests that the lab over in Cambodia could run. Uh, so this involves the teams collecting blood samples from crocodiles in the farms, uh, the lab extracting the DNA, and then running a mitochondrial sequencing test and a SNP phenotyping test. So SNP stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. And it basically just means there's a single change within the genetic code uh, between the saltwater and the Siamese crocodile at, at a known region. So we work out these SNPs by looking at known Siamese crocodiles and known saltwater crocodiles and looking for the variation and the differences. So we've got 25 SNPs that we know, for example, in this one are a C in Siamese crocodiles and are a T in saltwater crocodiles. So then we can just look at these 25 locations within the genome of the farm crocodiles to work out how much uh, Siamese and saltwater uh, genetic ancestry uh, the individuals have. Uh, so just an important point with when running a test like this is that we're not going to identify every single crocodile that has hybrid ancestry within it. So just to provide you an example, I've got basically a crocodile family tree on the slide here. You can see a hybridization event has occurred up here on the top on the top right. 
So Siamese crocodiles are in green and saltwater crocodiles are in yellow. Uh, there's been a breeding a hybridization event between them here, producing an F1 hybrid. So this is basically a crocodile that's 50% saltwater genetics and Siamese, 50% uh, Siamese crocodile genetics. However, if this crocodile then, and our test would, would identify it as a hybrid crocodile and we'd exclude it from the breeding program. However, if this crocodile then uh, mated with a Siamese crocodile, which we term as a back cross because it's got a hybrid uh, mates with one of the, the parental species, its offspring is only going to be 25% uh, saltwater uh, 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 genetic ancestry and 75% Siamese ancestry. So in this first generation back cross, our test would still identify it as having hybrid ancestry and would exclude it from the program. The same is also the case for a second generation back cross. So again, if this first generation individual mates with a Siamese crocodile, it will produce an offspring that is only an eighth saltwater crocodile ancestry. Our test will still pick that up and it would be classed as a, as a hybrid that we would exclude from the program. However, once this second generation back cross mates with a Siamese crocodile, the resolution of our test is no longer able to identify its offspring as a hybrid or a Siamese crocodile, and we wouldn't be able to screen those individuals out. So what we're doing with this test is getting rid of the most problematic individuals from the breeding program, and then uh, using the other individuals to set up and use in the reintroductions. So it's just a really important point to be aware of when we're conducting hybridization. And I just want you to show some of uh, the results on the 354 crocodiles uh, that we have screened. So this, we've, actually, sorry, we've actually screened uh, over 400 crocodiles now. Uh, and we've just had another batch of 80 crocodiles arrive in the Cambodian lab last week uh, that the, the team are busy extracting DNA from now. Uh, but these, this shows uh, the first uh, 354 uh, crocodiles we've tested, and it's a structure plot. So this is a really common way of visualizing genetic data within uh, a genetic community. If you're not familiar with one of these, I'll just uh, try and talk you through it. So each of, uh, so in this plot here, each of these columns is a single individual that's been tested. And the amount of green in that column is the amount of Siamese crocodile ancestry within that individual. And the amount of yellow is the amount of saltwater crocodile ancestry uh, in that individual. So that's how you can, you can think about it and visualize it. Um, a big takeaway from this is that there's a lot of green. So that's really good news. Uh, the majority of the samples that we've tested have Siamese crocodile ancestry. So that's been really great for the, the breeding and release program. Uh, however, you will notice some blocks of yellow here. So this one here, don't worry, these were known saltwater crocodiles that were used as positive controls. So there's about 20 individuals here that all show 100% saltwater crocodile ancestry, and they are known uh, wild saltwater crocodiles. So that's that's great. We've also got known wild uh, Siamese crocodiles within these tests as well that come out as 100% as uh, green uh, in these columns. But what you'll notice is that there's quite a few crocodiles that have both green and yellow in their columns. And these are the ones that have mixed ancestry. And so these are the hybrids that we identify and then we can uh, update the Border and Floor International that these shouldn't be used uh, for the, the conservation breeding program. And so far, we've found about 10% of the crocodiles that we've tested have come back with hybrid ancestry. So we're screening those ones, those ones out. So that is the first test that we conduct in the lab. You're, I did mention that we do two different genetic tests. Uh, the second one is the mitochondrial sequencing test. So it's, it's slightly different in that we're sequencing one region within, within each crocodile. And we have a database of saltwater and Siamese uh, sequences, and so we can compare and check whether we've got a saltwater or a Siamese uh, sequence within that mitochondrial sequence. And so we get a readout like this from this test. Uh, and what we found is that there are some individuals that didn't match the saltwater or Siamese crocodiles within, within our, our, our database. And in fact, they actually matched this species here. Uh, this is a completely different species. Uh, called the Cuban crocodile, and as its name suggests, it's not found, or it's not from Cambodia, it's from uh, one island in the Caribbean, uh, Cuba, uh, and it also happens to be a critically endangered species. And somehow it's made its way to the leather farms in Cambodia. Uh, and we're actually 
we've actually picked up a few samples with this mitochondrial uh, uh, marker that's, uh, that suggests that they have Cuban crocodile ancestry. Uh, and so this is a bit of an unexpected result, and we're now focusing on uh, trying to uh, develop markers and include this within our screening. Uh, and it, it's, it looks like the hybrid test that we've been running, uh, a lot of that hybrid signature is coming from the Cuban crocodile hybridization that's occurring uh, within, within the farms as well. Uh, so that's continuing work and something that we are now uh, working with the lab on as well. Uh, going forward, as well as uh, continuing to screen uh, the new the new farmed blood samples. Uh, so that is uh, uh, a very brief uh, overview of the crocodile uh, uh, project that we're involved in in Cambodia. Uh, I'm going to focus now on the Asian elephant work. So this was actually one of the main projects that we first started working uh, with the lab on, and we've had various iterations and various different focuses for this project. Uh, I'm going to focus uh, just on one of the most recent uh, uh, iterations of, of the project work, which is uh, focused on population monitoring of some of the Asian elephants uh, within the country. Uh, and the reason that we're focusing on Asian elephants is that it's classified as endangered and it's undergone huge declines uh, in the last 60 years. So to be classified as endangered, it's, gone, it's undergone a 50% decline uh, in the last 60 years. Uh, so massive declines, and as you can see from the map on the right-hand side, uh, depicts in the historic range in light red, and the current range in dark red. So you can see you can see there's been a huge contraction in the range of Asian elephants, and there's actually thought to have uh, uh, three uh, subspecies are thought to have gone extinct. Uh, so this decline has been happening for a really long period of time, uh, perhaps over a, a thousand years, uh, leading to uh, to the extinction on the range edges of this species. And as you can see in Cambodia, oh, sorry, and it's led to uh, habitat fragmentation for this species as well. So you can see the dark red is, is separated into lots of separate fragments now. And that, again, from a genetic diversity point of view, that's, that's not great because you can't have the exchange of genetics between those populations uh, very easy anymore. And it can lead to uh, in, inbreeding and, and further genetic diversity decline. Uh, and as you can see in Cambodia, there's been huge declines as well. So there's populations just really remaining at the edge of the country. So I'll just zoom in on Cambodia and, and show you some of the work that we've been working on. So this is a map of Cambodia. Uh, we have, uh, there's thought to be between 400 and 600 elephants remaining in the country. Uh, but this is a really rough estimate. It's, a lot of it's based on very anecdotal evidence. The Asian elephants, although they're the, the biggest land mammal in Asia, they're really, really elusive. They're really hard to, to find and to count and to estimate population sizes from because they live in really dense jungle. And so you can be really near, near them, but you can't see them or count them uh, or, or, or survey them in using uh, traditional techniques. Uh, and the, the two main areas uh, that they're thought to remain within is the Eastern Plains landscape uh, in the east of the country and the Cardinal Mountains. So the picture that I showed you where the Siamese crocodiles were found uh, uh, earlier as well. These are basically two highland regions within the country where deforestation has not been as extensive as in uh, much of the rest of the country. Uh, and more recently, we've been also been focusing on this northern landscape. So it's called the Prey Long Extended Landscape. Uh, and in all three of these locations, there is elephant signs and there's anecdotal evidence of elephants, but there's no real uh, nationwide uh, robust estimate of population sizes. So that's what we've been working with the lab in Cambodia to do is to basically help inform the government and the NGOs that are working in the country how many elephants are in each of the protected areas. And we can use, we can do that using genetics because instead of counting and finding the elephants, we can get genetic signatures. Uh, from dung that the elephants leave behind. And then those unique genetic fingerprints can be used to count up the number of individuals that are found within uh, the protected area. So this is uh, the prey long extended landscape. It's just a satellite image that I've overlaid on here, just to give you an indication of, of where the forest is still found within this region. Uh, and again, this hasn't been as studied from uh, uh, from uh, an elephant perspective in the same way that Eastern Plains and the Cardinal Mountains have. Uh, 
uh, has been previously. So there's unknown number of wild elephants uh, remaining within that region. We have been involved in projects previously in the other two regions uh, to help uh, estimate population size. Uh, so this is a zoom in of that satellite image. Uh, and the study I'm gonna talk about, again, is a really close collaboration with Fauna and Flora International, uh, who are focused focusing conservation efforts in the very long area. Uh, and in 2021, uh, they collected elephant dung samples from uh, three different uh, protected areas within the region uh, after doing uh, surveys to, to uh, uh, basically survey for any kind of indirect elephant signs within the region. So they also surveys, surveyed another area as you can see on the left of this map, that they didn't find any signs in. And so the collection was only focused on these two protected areas. Uh, yeah, and so the field teams of FFI were out in the field collecting uh, swabs or genetic swabs from these dung samples that uh, were then sent back to the lab with Tom Pem. Uh, they did six uh, different survey expeditions over about a six month period uh, to collect uh, hundreds of elephant. Uh, dung samples are in the region. Yeah, and these were uh, transported to the lab, uh, where again we transferred uh, techniques to study and have been transferring techniques for uh, for various projects on elephants uh, since 2016. This is just some of the recent uh, training that we've done. Uh, and again, we uh, have used two different techniques in this project. So one was similar to the crocodiles in that we were using SNPs. So that's uh, to get an individual ID or what you can think of as a genetic fingerprint of each single elephant that has produced the dung sample. Uh, and obviously you can collect dung samples that have been produced by the same elephant, but if we can individual ID each of those, we can tell which ones have been produced by, by each elephant and count up how many elephants uh, we have within the environment. We also ran a genetic sexing test. So again, this is really important for the conservation of, or the uh, conservation planning for elephants in particular, because the sex ratio can have a really big impact on uh, breeding productivity and, and the long-term uh, prospect of a population. So we ran a genetic sexing test so we could identify uh, the sex ratios within each of these protected uh, areas. Uh, the teams in the field also look at dung size and bolus circumference to get an idea of uh, the ages of the elephants as well to tell whether uh, there's any young juvenile elephants and the population is 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 breeding successfully uh, and so it's multi-faceted approach that we're using to try and uh, build up and get information to build a, a national uh, elephant conservation plan So I'm just going to show you, there's obviously a lot of genetic work involved in getting those genetic fingerprints and running those tests, uh, sex and tests. I'm just going to show you the results of how many genetic fingerprints we uh, we found and, and the estimates of the population sizes in these two areas. So we found 20 elephants in the northern uh, wildlife sanctuaries and 31 elephants in the Prelong wildlife sanctuary. So these are really, really low numbers of of elephants compared to the other two regions in Cambodia that we've been looking at and helping with previously. Uh, the reason that I'm giving you both of the figures separately is because we didn't find any evidence of these elephants moving between the Prey Long Wildlife Sanctuary and the Prey Rocker and Cheb Wildlife Sanctuary in the north. However, there was evidence of moving between those two northern sanctuaries. Uh, so it's likely that there is some fragmentation occurring here uh, and that there's limited uh, movement of elephants potentially between these two areas. So we analyzed those uh, both separately. Uh, and we're also, we also produced uh, genetic diversity data as well for both of uh, these uh, elephant groups uh, within this environment. Uh, and that's now being fed into a bigger picture of elephants uh, nationwide across Cambodia, uh, looking at genetic diversity between uh, these three different areas where elephants still remain. Uh, so as well as that, we've also been focusing on uh, uh, getting a database together to compare ivory samples to as well. Uh, but this is the main monitoring work that we've been doing recently. And we're just about to start a project in the southern part of the Eastern Plains as well to fill in uh, uh, a gap in, in some of the, the population work. So that's uh, a brief introduction to the Cambodia project. Uh, Obviously, we have much wider impact uh, at RZSS Wild Genes. Uh, since 2010, we've been working on over 70 different species. 
Uh, and in our biobank, we have uh, data from over 300 species uh, that's fed, being fed into current programs, but also uh, is, is there for researchers around the world uh, to, to use for conservation questions in the future. Uh, and if you do want to find out any more information about our projects, you can obviously go online to our website. We have lots of uh, updates about our various projects. Uh, we also have some YouTube videos as well that delve into a few of our projects in a bit more detail. So the links are on, on, on the slide here if you want to go and have a, have a bit more of a look at those. Uh, and that just leads me to thank uh, everyone uh, for listening today uh, and to thank all of our partners on our conservation genetic projects. So conservation is a huge collaborative uh, 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 project and, and vision and you need input from so many different players and, and stakeholders. Uh, and obviously, in the projects that I've mentioned today, the key ones were Fauna and Flora International, uh, the Ministry of Environment in Cambodia, and the Royal University of Phnom Penh. Uh, so I want to thank all of the staff and partners uh, involved in, in, in those projects. Uh, yeah, and I think we're going, we've got time for questions as well. Great. Thank you very much, Alex, for that um, really informative overview of the work um, that the lab is conducting in Cambodia. And I was wondering, do you want to just um, stop sharing your screen mm -hmm. so that we can go to full screen mode? Um, and I can see that there's um, questions coming in in the chat already, which is great, um, and encourage you to post any questions that you have in the in the chat and we can we can answer them as we go, but we've already got a question here from Roger, um, which is a really good question. Um, I suppose that crocodile hybridization in the wild is just part of natural selection and evolution. So why avoid it in captivity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So uh, there is there is some evidence of some uh, there, like introgression, so basically that's another term for, for hybridization between saltwater and Siamese crocodiles uh, in, in the past. So there is that remnant of, of introgression hybridization that has occurred in that species in the wild uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago. And so it is something that happens and it is a big component uh, within uh, that does lead to potentially new species occurring as well. Uh, so it is a natural process that occurs in the wild. Uh, however, these two, uh, the Siamese and saltwater crocodile, have been separated uh, and don't commonly hybridize in in uh, in the wild, uh, especially now when they they don't overlap in their ranges at all. So uh, the only found in the Cardamom Mountains, a saltwater crocodile would would not be found in the Cardamom Mountains, uh, and also about the different behaviors between these these uh, two species and the different environments that they're found in. It can potentially lead to us releasing very uh, aggressive large crocodiles into uh, very small freshwater streams if we didn't screen out the, the saltwater hybrids uh, from uh, using these, this genetic process. Uh, and I did, I use the word purposefully hybridized in captivity as well because there's, there'll be very different levels of hybridization both in the wild and in captivity. And in in the leather farms, they purposely hybridize them to try and improve the leather quality, basically use the the different aspects that they want from each of the crocodiles to produce different kinds of leather. And so there's much higher amounts of hybridization within these farms than there would be found in the wild. So hopefully that answers your, your question, but it's, it's a very good one. Great, thanks, Alex. Um... I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the challenges of doing this sort of work um, and why why do it in Cambodia and, and not not in the lab here in Scotland? Yeah, no, so there is a yeah, there are a huge yeah, number of challenges involved in, in international projects uh, of, of, of this. But one of the reasons we are we do it in Cambodia is because we really, the only term, only way you're going to get long-term conservation uh, buy-in and progress is if you provide the tools to the people that are living alongside these, these species. And so providing them with the tools, they can then apply these to the species uh, within, their, within their country and uh, also to other species that may become threatened or need, uh, need conservation data work in the future. 
So it's a really big part of our approach. And we don't just do it in Cambodia. We've done it in other countries as well. Uh, and one of the reasons that we focus on Cambodia is because it is a really under or low economic country. So it has very few resources uh, of its own uh, to, to put into, into projects like this. So uh, we can help develop te techniques, uh, but then we take them over there because also there's lots of uh, difficulties with moving genetic samples around the world as well. So having them not have to, to travel halfway across the world for this work is, is a great bonus. Great, thanks, Alex. Um, I'm just wondering as well um, if there's any parallels to the work that you're doing in Cambodia to other projects in, here in Scotland. Yeah, so there's uh, so a project that people might be familiar with uh, within within here is uh, the Wildcat uh, Breeding and Release project that's currently undergoing in the Cairngorms National Park. So that just uh, occurred. Well, the first release, yeah. So the first releases are going to be occurring this year uh, for that project. Uh, and there's been a hybridization screen that has happened in wildcats as well because of hybridization that has occurred between uh, feral and domestic cats and European wildcat. So uh, feral domestic cats are originated from the Near Eastern or African wildcat, uh, and uh, there's been a lot of hybridization between those and the the European wildcat in Scotland. And so that is a really uh, uh, a parallel between the Siamese crocodile work we're doing. And we're using very similar tools to look at the hybridization question in both of those projects as well. Great, thanks, Alex. Um, and another question from Mary. Do you feel that in Cambodia, People, local people are supportive of your projects and maybe um, whether you've got uh, projects, whether you're doing this sort of work in other places as well. Mm. So, yeah, one of the really great things about, especially about the Siamese crocodile project in Cambodia is that one of the reasons that that species is still in the wild with us is because of the local community there. So the local community uh, have safeguarded the crocodile species in the Kaldura mountain. Uh, so the indigenous people of that region basically seen, saw them as sacred and did their own patrols to try and protect this crocodile, even before we, like the Western world and, and scientists knew that it was still remaining there. Uh, and that's, so I think there's a lot of buy-in from the local communities from this project, which is been really great. Uh, and I think FFI and Pablo Sinovus in Cambodia will probably be able to answer this question a lot better because uh, he works on the ground with those with those communities uh, all the time as part of this project. Uh, I work with the university, which does, uh, it caters to uh, students from all over the country. And there's just, there's a huge thirst for knowledge within the university, which has been really great to see. And so yeah, I think we get in the excitement about this novel technology can also get people on board with conservation and feeds into those conservation messages as, as well. Because obviously, I, it's just it's really nice to see how focused and dedicated people are to improving the national situation in Cambodia, uh, and they want to just they want a load of tools and different ways of trying to improve that improve that national situation. So that's been a really great thing to see and, and great to be involved in. with. Great, thanks, Alex. Um, just checking another question. Um, many critically endangered species exist in tiny, often fragmented populations. So, loss of genetic diversity must be a very wide problem. Um, sort of more generally, how can it be mitigated? Yeah, it's it's. Uh, yeah, it's a huge problem, and it's it's a common theme of of the species that we work with because they are they are small. Just by definition, they are threatened. They have declined, and they're often in small fragmented populations. You're completely right. Uh, and we don't know all of the long term impacts that this loss of genetic diversity is going to uh, cause in each of these separate species. Uh, but we know that inbreeding is a massive problem and that uh, lack of genetic diversity could mean 
that we don't have or that that species doesn't have the ability to adapt as well as if it had more diversity. So one of the ways that we can mitigate that, or the most obvious one, is not to let the declines happen in the first place, uh, and that will retain the diversity. It's also really important to uh, uh, move or translocate individuals between populations if it's if they can no longer move uh, naturally. Uh, and that helps to sustain, like you can think of it as like a meta population that's larger than the sum of each of the parts. And so you can transfer genetic diversity that may only be found in one of those populations still to those other populations and help safeguard it uh, in, into the future. That's like a very uh, general, general, uh, uh, general way of, of trying to conserve it. Great. Thank you, Alex. Um, I think that might be all of the oh there's another question that's come up in the chat um so from ian lewis um with respect to translocation of individuals um are you also creating a stub book yeah this is a really good question uh so we currently don't have uh, a stud book of the wild of the wild crocodiles or the releases but we could uh, create one using using genetics, and that's actually a focus of essentially the next phase of our Siamese crocodile work is to try and work out which individuals are surviving in the wild uh, post reintroduction, and basically by creating individual genetic fingerprints from all of the individuals that, like we have for the elephants, do it for the crocodiles, and that can uh, build up not a stud book but like a relatedness network that we can then uh, use in the stud book. Like scenario uh, and it is something we are looking into for other species as well that we work on uh, that have been brought potentially been brought into captivity from wild populations and to keep really accurate uh, stud books of them uh, which is really important from a conservation perspective and this is again one of the great things about being part of the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland is that that's routinely done for all of the, the European captive populations stud books are, are, are kept uh, and that can allow us to uh, uh, mitigate loss of genetic diversity uh, by making sure we have founder representation uh, being maintained through generations within the captive populations. Great. Well, thank you very much, Alex. Um, on behalf of the Royal Society of Edinburgh Investigates um, Conservation Series, very pleased to have you speaking about um, conservation genetic issues in Cambodia and really an example of how um, genetic technology can be used to help with protecting the genetic diversity for threatened species. <laughs>